Okay guys, welcome back. Um, obviously this will be, I guess, the start of our off-season tech videos. Um, this is uh, one thing that I obviously did last season, which I did a lot of the car build. Um, this year, obviously being that I've covered the car build and I probably don't need to cover it again, um, I've decided to pick apart one of the car parts of the car, which is um, shock absorbers and suspension. So that it, that will include a bit of uh, coil spring and torsion bar stuff as well. So probably one of those things which a lot of people uh, understand what the parts are, but not necessarily how much the parts exactly work or uh, operate. So um, what I'm basically gonna try to do it is, is break it down into a lot of the, the little bits into just basic things in, in a smaller, I guess, version of itself. So, uh, you know, it just becomes a whole lot more simpler and you can hopefully everyone can understand as everything as uh, you know smaller pieces to come together to make something work so uh, like I say this video will start off with shock absorbers and I've um, just behind me I've cut open two shocks so you'll be able to see from the outside in what's kind of going on and, and the parts inside them and some of the intricacies about them so we'll roll into the video okay so what we have in front of us is the uh, two shocks which I've prepared here in front of us so what I've got on the left side here is a uh, large body twin tube shock, probably more commonly known as the, the sprint car twin tube shock that Factory Kane does. And on this side is the gas um, shock or mono tube. Um, obviously, the difference between the two what happens with a what you call an oil or a twin tube shock, it is, has exactly what you call it. So there's two tubes so there's an inner tube and an outer tube. Then obviously with the gas shock you have what they call mono tube, which is exactly that too. Mono being single, obviously one tube. So all that has is the body, which is the outer tube. Now the big part between the two is that obviously if you get a dent on anywhere on the body with a uh, gas shock, you are damaging the inside of the of the body or the bore. Versus an oil shock in this instance. Um, you can get away with some pretty aggressive dents. Um, as you can see, this one here actually had quite a bit of a dent in it. But um, you know, you can get away with that being that that doesn't protrude into the inner tube, which then has the uh, you can see there the piston run in it. Again, obviously, with all the uh, differences between the two shocks, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was uh, the difference of going to a twin tube. With the protection of the body in an inner tube, there is a sacrifice, obviously, and that is piston size. So what we've got there is roughly an inch in diameter, or 25 millimeters. And here we have our gas or uh, mono tube piston, which is roughly an inch and three eighth, or 35 millimeters. So if you put them side by side, we get a good comparison. Obviously, the mono tube shock here is a lot, lot smaller. Uh, obviously this piston is not out of this style shock. This is out of what they call a small body twin tube which gives you the same capability to run a coil spring on a threaded body like this. So for this shocks in particular where they've got no restriction with outer diameter they've actually made the shock a lot bigger which comes with a weight disadvantage and size and uh, I guess compactness. So like I say, sac big sacrifice when you're talking about something that you either need to uh, contain around a coil spring like this or a tight area um, specifically. So to add to that too, if you imagine if you're trying to push something through that size of an area versus that size of area, if you're pumping something through a bigger diameter it gives you a lot more f uh, flow control as opposed to you're pumping so much through a small diameter you end up really pushing the limits on what you can control through a smaller piston. So preferred piston diameter is to be as big as possible but within the confines of what you can afford in terms of space. With that being, you obviously need some form of a uh, compressible area to allow the shaft to come in inside the shock as it, as it goes through its compression stroke. Um, now the easiest way to explain that is to imagine filling up the bath full and you know right to the brim and hopping in yourself and the bath overflows well as something comes in which is obviously the shaft you can see in there the shock displaces oil and it needs to go somewhere so that's the purpose of the gas inside the shock is that the gas becomes a compressible area 
uh, to overcome the volume of the shaft coming inside the shock. Now how this is handled with the uh, both shocks here is a little bit different from uh, shock to shock. So with a monotube shock they do what they call a floating piston or a separating piston. So what we've got here is a piston here which has obviously got an o-ring which goes through its own bore and uh, separates the oil from the shock here to then what would be uh, gas or nitrogen pressure on this side of the piston. So, and obviously as you can see here, we can adjust that with a Schrader valve tool. So, one big thing is that means you can change your gas pressure with this. So I'll go back to the oil shock or the, the twin tube. Now the way they overcome this here is obviously there is no Schrader valve along the shock anywhere. So it's a fixed uh, thing that they have. There's no way to add gas or take away gas. But what they do is they have what they call a gas bag, which has become quite a common phrase to some people, but they've probably never seen one, which is, oh, the shock's blowing a gas bag. Um, obviously, that's usually caused by rougher tracks, where the shock is going through really extreme conditions and is demanding a lot, usually through the compression stroke, which then, in terms, it's displacing oil so fast that the bag either gets overheated and uh, the plastic, obviously, film that it's made out of um, becomes deteriorated or uh, kind of almost melts to an extent or the just the sheer force um, basically bursts the bag. Okay now moving on obviously now we've figured out that we've got obviously a gas bag in here to take out the uh, shaft displacement and then we use the floating piston here with a, a certain amount of gas in the gas uh, area to take out the displacement on a on our monotube shock or gas shock. What we have also which regulates the pressure between the oil being displaced by the shaft and the compression stroke, they use what they call a base valve. Now it's become a common term in the shock world which the a, an oil shock or a twin tube for the longest time have always had what they call a base valve or some form of metering valve. However, in monotube shocks, it's become more and more popular, especially in the dirt racing world, is to have what they call a base valve, which is one of these here. It's probably not the easiest to see, but you can kind of see the glimpse of, of red in there, along with the shim stacks. So like I say, what I've got on my hand here is the base valve, which has, as you can see, there's three holes on there, which as the pressure comes through, from this side, it pushes oils through those three holes. But then what causes the regulation or allow, uh, provides the resistance is the stack of shims. So what they are, if you imagine a thin washer which of different sizes and special metals, which they deflect as the, the oil tries to come through. So. That's what obviously regulates the pressure between the two. Now, like I was saying before, the twin tubes shocks, this has been a feature for a very, very long time. But with monotube shocks, again, it's a feature that's been there for a long time, but has, as of lately, has really be become something quite critical to the operation of the shocks, especially in dirt racing. So what these do is, like I was saying before, they regulate pressure. So in previous uh, operations with monotube shocks, they would sometimes not even run a base valve, which means as the shock would compress, it's directly pushing on our floating piston here, which only has gas pressure. That then obviously makes this float around a lot more because it's dealing with uh, fluctuations. And if you imagine the car driving down the road, it's doing a lot of bumping and oscillations that are kind of makes it numb to operation where it's just stuff that is, is constantly happening but not necessarily uh, important to kind of the control of the vehicle. But that small movement up and down can then numb that micro movement when you're really trying to control the car as the car would turn and set in the corner. So how they combated this is obviously by these base valves. And one big difference is that you'll always be able to tell, especially if you've just had your shocks dynoed or got a dyno sheet and it's got a recommended gas pressure, Usually you'll notice that 
a non-base valve shock, so that doesn't have one of these in it, will have gas pressures recommended somewhere between 50 to 80 psi. However, if you use these base valve, which would be a base valve shock, it will get have a gas pressure sometimes even between 5 to 30 psi as a recommended pressure. This might not mean a lot now, but this is one of the many things we'll dive into in the next few videos or so.